Today, we're thrilled to be joined by Sophie Bambuck, the CMO of North Face. In 2018, Sophie was named one of Forbes 50 CMOs who are redefining the role. And six years later, she has no intention of slowing down. Sophie, so great to see you here in Las Vegas for CES. Thanks for having me. Very excited. Absolutely. You know, it's funny, CES has not always been the conference that every marketer came to. It was actually no. originally just for people who made actual consumer electronics. Um, why is it important for North Face to be at a conference like this and, and understand the, the world of technology? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's twofold. One is relationship, right? Um, there's a lot of people in the industry now that we know who are here. We actually also see a lot of media partners yeah. that are now at CES. So it's important for us at Brand to be here and make sure that we get the FaceTime uh, during the year. We usually don't you know, get to see each other very much. Sure. So this is a moment. Um, and then also we just want to know what's, what's coming up, what's coming next. I mean, CES is a place where... All the new cool stuff is happening. Yeah. So we want to see what's going on. Um, I'm going to actually tomorrow morning. I'm planning on walking the floor to see health and wellness. Always a and good sport. idea. Yeah, just just to see what's up. Even if I don't actually have a direct business, I just want to know. I'm curious. So I want to know what's out there. And you never know where inspiration comes from, right? Yeah, so. and and I think the worlds of fitness and technology yeah. have obviously very much overlapped in the last couple of years oh, with sure. the Apple Watch and with the R ring and, and the Whoop yeah, and all yeah, that. So, yeah. I mean, is that a space that North Face is actively looking at? No, not actively. I mean, it's a space that we're interested in, of course. It's not a space that we're necessarily investing in. Um, I think right now it's more because we're so focused on our apparel and footwear innovation. This is very much where we where we're, you know, focused. Um, but even in that, I mean, when you think about apparel innovation nowadays, within your apparel, there's so much you can do. So um, we're, again, maybe it's less purposeful right now. It's more curiosity. I yeah. think eventually we'll probably get to a place where it makes sense. Um, but I've had in my in my career, I've had many uh, stints uh, working on, on wearables and all that. And I see, I see when it works and how very often also it doesn't work. So yeah. Um, we're we're not rushing in. Uh, it would need to make a lot of sense for us to get to go there. Yeah. yeah, and and speaking of early in your career, you spent ten years at Nike um, as your 15, first actually. fifteen actually. Oh, yeah, because Converse, Converse Converse is part of Nike. Right, yeah, right, yeah. right. So it's fifteen years at Nike. Yeah. Um, obviously iconic brand. Yeah. If you look back, um, you know, at your at your entire stint there, what were some of the main takeaways? Because obviously they do so many things right. I would imagine that you learn so much there. Mm -hmm. What comes to mind? Yeah, I mean, when you're a marketer, I think it's the best school for marketing. Um, Nike doesn't also, Nike does Nike marketing. Um, it doesn't always translate or transfer to other brands. Uh, that's the number one question when I've gone to other brands, people want to I always ask, can we do the same that Nike does? Well, actually, it's it's kind of hard. Nike has a specific way of doing things and it doesn't work for where we were. But I do think that I've learned the value of brand. I've learned the value of creative. I've learned the value of product marketing and how product marketing can be brand yeah. and aspirational. Um, well, to the consumer, it's all very much connected. Exactly. It's really about providing benefits to the consumer and solving problems that they might not even know that they had. And so in the process of doing that, how do you build your brand? How do you create affinity for your product? Um, and honestly, Nike, you know, has been one of the best at, at this. So um, I have to say that's the number one thing I learned. I learned how to be a marketer. I learned what it is uh, to be a well-rounded um, uh, marketer. Um, but then also there's the benefit of Nike being such a powerhouse that you said it does it does a lot of things right. It actually does a lot of things wrong. But the beauty is actually failure is encouraged um, because you learn from it and then you reiterate and you improve. And that's obviously something that only a very healthy and big company can afford to do. Uh, but that's the beauty of working in such a big, with such a big brand is you can actually fail and learn. Um, when you don't fail, you don't evolve, right? Yeah. And so um, that's, I'd say that's the other thing that I learned is to take risks and um, experiment. Yeah. I know um, it's Hollywood, but you know, the movie Air, yeah. Uh, yeah. where, you know, they go through, they chronicle the formulation of, their Jordans yeah. and before they met and brought on Michael Jordan they talked about how the it was the the sneaker the basketball brand was like about to go under yeah. they they couldn't get it right and they kept trying and trying and then finally they hit gold with Michael Jordan right sure. so it's a kind of a microcosm of what you're talking about you have to fail fail until you finally get it and it's about having big ambitious goals it's uh even if it feels unattainable or even if it feels like there's no way um you know, that's what I, I loved. I don't know if Nike today does the same thing, but right. back in the day, it was very much about we're going to become a women's brand or we're going to 
going to skate. I mean, Nike going to football, soccer, you know, was a big deal. Yeah, Nike U.S. based going... company diving in. Adidas oh, had a huge presence already. It was. Yeah. Even internally, it was like, can we do this? You know, and going after skate was the same thing. I mean, skaters did not really want a big brand getting into skate. And then you saw the, the work of Sandy Bodecker and all that. I mean, it was, it's beautiful. Big ambitious goals. What goes into entering a new category like that, going into skate at a company like Nike? Authenticity, yeah. Authenticity, uh, making sure the right people are uh, involved in the conversation, that you're taking as much insight from the community as possible, um, and making sure that everything that comes out, whether it starts with product always, um, but everything is thought through. Again, when I say so, ser serving the consumer, it's that with that authenticity and that insight, how do you actually build the best product with the resources that you have? So again, when you're a big company like that, it's easier because you have access to a lot. Sure. Um, but that's what it but takes. You can't always just buy your way in. No. Like we've seen a lot of companies try to buy work. their way in to compete with Nike and they weren't able to it succeed. Work. Yeah. It doesn't work. And and again, that's also why sometimes you try, you try, but if you didn't have the right insight, you have to go back to the drawing board and do it again. Um, so it's, Really, at the core, is making sure do you understand your audience that you're going the, the new audience that you're all going about. after always. Yeah. yeah. So, what's behind the decision to leave a company like mm -hmm. Nike? You're on the fast track yeah. there. You were there for 15 years, working your way up the corporate ladder at an iconic company. And one day you say, you know what, I'm ready to try something else. Like, what goes behind that decision? A lot. Yeah. Um, a lot. Definitely, it's scary. Um, mostly because at the time people did not really leave Nike. And so um, making that decision was scary because I didn't really have anybody to talk to about how do you leave Nike? I mean, literally, I had one friend I remember I called and I'm like, how did you leave? Like, what's the process to leave? That's how inf infrequent that was. Right. Um, for me, it was about a few things. One is I had this fear of the 15-year mark. Uh, I was worried that if I had only done one big company for 15 years, then people would just think that I only know when to do how to do one thing yeah and i didn't want that to be the case so i felt like i had always in my mind this 15 year mark now i love the brand kind I of love arbitrary that. is it 15 years it's just yeah i don't know it, right. was, it was something that i put in my head i right. don't know you know the maybe corporate because, version of the seven year itch yeah like, right. maybe it's because i passed the 10 years i'm like okay we'll find the next one is right. 15. right um but you know to this day I still love the brand uh it's a great brand and i will never not love the brand um but at realized that I could love the brand and not work there. Of course. Um, and so that, just that was like whew, a light bulb for me to realize I didn't have to, to work there. Um, and then I wanted to learn more. I was in senior roles where I was pretty disconnected from the marketing mix. Um, and I wanted to really understand more about uh, the digital uh, marketing environment uh, and data. Um, at Nike, it was very separate. It wasn't part of my day-to-day. -day. I mean, I would set strategy, but then there would be teams just making it happen. Right. It wasn't necessarily a part of that. And I wanted to be the person moving up the dial, up and down. And uh, I knew I couldn't do it there. Um, and so then, getting your hands dirty a little more. I wanted more. to get yeah. my hands dirty and I wanted to learn more. And then, uh, you know, and the other thing that happened is there was a massive reorg. Um, and the categories uh, went away. And I used to run Nike Sportswear. And... Um, and I, you know, that that new that new operating model didn't make sense. Right. To so me it just so felt much. like it was time. It was time. Yeah. It was time. So I went to a digital native uh, startup. Yeah. To, to get my hands. Started. And how was that going from a big company to it looks like it was Everlane? Yeah. Uh, that must have been culture <laughs> shock for you. Um, I was I was prepared. I had I talked to enough people to understand the landscape. Uh, but yeah, for sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, you go from like complaining about your ops team to not having an ops team, right. you know? <laughs> so um, I really liked it. I really liked, I learned a lot. I mean, talk about getting your hands dirty. I mean, or s sending an email about right. a new pair of jeans on the hottest of the year. You know, it's the stuff that like I had never had to really think about. Um, and tweaking daily, looking at numbers daily, uh, definitely weekly, but for sure daily at that time. Um, I I definitely did more data crunching than I had. Yeah, I know <laughs> about that. Yeah. Before. Um so no, I it was a really really good experience. Um and it's, it's such a good brand. I love Everlane. It's it's uh I was already a consumer right uh, before before joining so right. yeah. So what was behind the decision for you to 
join North Face? What about yeah. North Face excited you? And tell me about your role today and where your focus is. Yeah, um, I think I got I got worried that marketing wasn't right for me anymore. Um, and I when I left Everlane because a lot of the roles out there were so heavy growth and performance. And that's not so the world who I was am. heading in that way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not who I am. I mean, it's part of what I do and I understand it and I can do it. That's not what I want to do every day. I want to set strategy. I want to think about who the consumer will be in three years. I want to do cool shit. Yeah. You know, I want to have fun and right. actually build a brand. And there's not that many companies that are willing to invest in brand, the which North creates an opportunity. A hundred percent. Yeah. I mean, and I'm seeing the pendulum swinging. I'm seeing seeing now companies starting to say, "Okay, we're realizing we need to get back into that." Also, that performance space. is much harder now with all the privacy changes that have been enacted by 100%. Google and Apple. Right. I'm super excited about that change. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's also going to make, to make the conversations with CFOs a lot easier. It's like, hey, we can't track this anymore, so we're going to go do that. Right. <laughs> it's very much cyclical because with yeah. email, there was the email marketing era where everyone did it before. Yeah. There was direct mail. You have these kind of direct mediums. Programmatic was the, was the most recent one. And then oh. it kind of shifts back. And I think you're always going to have that push and pull. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think joining the North Face allowed me to still do brand. And there's not that many companies in the world that are brands. Um, they call themselves brands. They're not necessarily brands. And they're not necessarily, not necessarily investing in brand. The North Face is. Yeah. And uh, that's why. I mean, it was a no-brainer. The other thing is I'm at this stage in my career where it's a lot more about the people that I work with. Uh, and Nicole Otto, our brand president, was assembling a really killer team. And it was like, of course, of course, I want to be a part of that team. So that's... so what does it mean to be CMO of a company that is so brand focused? Like, where are you spending your time? And how, how do you define the North Face brand yeah. in that regard? Yeah, I mean, when you think of the North Face, very often you think big mountain, big sky, yeah. Everest, right? You're seeing somebody summiting. Hiking, or tents, yeah. Hiking, tents. Or you see the beautiful snowboard line, you know, coming down the mountain. That's kind of like traditionally what it's been. And that's still in my head when I think about the North Face. I definitely think about, uh -huh. you know, or the Yosemite North Face. And, yeah. Um, and that's not going away. That still is, I believe, the DNA of the North Face, and that's still who we are. Exploration, adventure. Exploration, aspiration, um, adventure, the outdoors, um, human potential. Absolutely. It's still it's at the core of who we are and what we do. And to me, it also um, translates to quality, right? You, you have to be able to trust the product. You know it's not going to let you down I mean, if you're out in the middle of the mountain. For sure. Right. Everything we do is athlete. We consider this athlete tested, expedition proven. So we have an athlete team. We have 150 athletes worldwide. They are the best in the outdoor space. Um, they are the people who do the first ascents, the first descents. They are snowboarders. They're trail runners. They test the product. Um, they rely on the product to live, to yeah. survive. We actually give them product in the harshest conditions in the world. Um, you're in a snowstorm in the middle of a mountain and you're in one of your sleeping bags in tents and you're relying on the earth face to keep you warm and get you through yeah, the night. Totally. Yeah. Or, or you're hanging by on with one hand and you need to be able to really quickly open your zipper with the other to grab your mask or... Like we have to make sure that that, that zipper opens yeah. when you did to open. It's literally um, could be life or death. It's life or death. Yeah, yeah. So not for all of them, but of you know, in the most extreme sense, it is life or death. And so, um, we have a responsibility. Um, so to your point about quality, <laughs> to your point about um, um, being what athletes need as they evolve as athletes, also, and then after that, figuring out, okay, great, now we've served the edge. Yeah. How do we actually trickle that down to the mass, right? Because maybe the mass doesn't need the pocket where Conrad Anchor needs the pocket. Right. Um, but that's so kind of the case with everything. You see the, the, the commercials for the Jeep going over the yes, rocks yes, on yes. the river. I mean, people aren't doing it. that. People totally. are driving in the suburbs of the yeah. mall. So, totally. so that, I mean, that's very exactly, common. Right. Very common. But you need to be inspired by the use case needs to be inspired by the most extreme condition. Um, and we innovate for the most extreme condition and we design for the most extreme condition. Um, and then from there, yeah, we translate that to, so to how, the consumer. So how you translate it to a broader audience? Mm, I think some of this, um, it starts, so again, we start with performance innovation. And then after that, we kind of, um, yeah, I talk about dials a lot, but it's like, when it's about the extreme condition, we dial up the performance innovation and maybe dial down 
uh, the style. There's still style, but we dial it down. When I when it's actually same jacket, but for use in the street, right, or in New York City, because it had become a, a a fashion symbol as well. North exactly. Face jackets, yeah. So we dial up the style and then bring down a little bit the. Was that the, by accident? The North Face become sort of a lifestyle fashion brand by accident, or was that by design? Um. Well, it's before my time, so I'll right. say you know. And at this point, everything is hearsay, right? Yeah, <laughs> I've heard so many stories. I think it's a little bit by accident. Yeah. Um, and by that, it's by what is not an accident is that the product was designed to serve a very specific condition, cold weather. Uh huh. And they were designed a certain way and went with certain color because it looked good. Right. And so that, that's purposeful. Right. Those are two pretty now, good attributes for a winter jacket. Exactly. Right. And now the fact that, you know, the street basically adopted it organically and saw the jacket and decided to wear it. And it kind of, you know, culturally, it, you know, picked up from that. It became an icon. Uh, it became, yeah, it is an iconic uh, piece of outerwear. Uh, we're talking about the Nupsy jacket here yeah. specifically. Um, I think that growth, that organic growth is a little bit, you know, once the consumer takes it, they make it an icon. As a brand, you can't I make also, something else. Yeah, well, I also think that consumers smell authenticity yeah, totally. and they smell, um, you know, the opposite. They smell when people are trying to fake it or buy their way in. So just the same way that Nike was able to gain it in categories, yeah. it was built within the realm of authenticity and consumers and kind adopted. of felt that. Exactly. Both literally and figuratively. Exactly. And then it became the way it got adopted. A hundred percent. I mean... And we're seeing it's cyclical as well, right? So we're seeing the like the somebody dubbed it like um, what do they call him Gorb Core. Um, it's like you're seeing the adoption of performance innovation uh, in style and fashion and yeah. on the street. It's not new that with an up see it happened. I mean, this was the first jacket where people were wearing on Everest, right? Like this this happened with an up see. This happened for us with Steep Deck, where everybody thought that was the coolest. Thing. Yeah, it, it was extreme ski gear and people were just wearing it in new york city sure know? so it's cyclical this keeps on coming back thankfully our product looks good and people want to wear it but it's not necessarily developed intentionally for the street right it's developed for the mountain it's developed for the outdoors and it gets adopted organically uh, in the street but that's how you know you have icons yeah like that's how you know you're doing well is when people decide the consumer decides the consumer decides what is uh, going to work and what it is going to stand the test of time or not. Uh, all we can do is just do the best we can. You know, yeah. All we can do is best design, best innovation, and really hope that it, you know, picks up. Yeah. So as CMO, I would imagine one part of your role is also understanding who your consumer is yeah. and working on consumer segmentation and understanding the different groups that may be attracted to different products and how to effectively communicate that. How do you go about doing that? Who are the core consumers that you have? Yeah, good question. So I'm actually um, when when I joined and uh, or a, a chief product officer joined at the fir at the same time as I did. Um, and the first thing that we agreed upon is to kind of move away from consumer segmentation. Interesting. Um, we actually work with mindsets, so we've developed four mindsets, uh, and those mindsets really encompass so psychographics versus demographics. Yes, in a way. I mean, it's more about behavior. Yeah, it's about behaviors mm -hmm. and intent. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, I always use the example. We have one of our athletes is somebody named Jimmy Chin, who is very famous in his own right. He's a award-winning director as well. But I always use his example. It's like he climbs Everest and he needs, in that moment in time, he needs he has a certain mindset, he has an intent, he has a purpose, and he needs gear for that particular moment in time. Then he might go on a surfing trip with his friends and he needs, you know, uh, he needs to be geared up for that and we need to serve him when he's in that mindset, which is maybe more, more community oriented. And then he really cares about conservation and he goes to Patagonia and does efforts over there. We want to be there to serve that mindset. And then he moves on the red carpet and he, we also want to be able to serve that mindset when really he's more worried about looking good. Yeah. Um, that's true for everybody. We all have those mindsets. Now, it might not be Everest. It might be another, um, uh, you know, obsessive or kind of like more intense, you know, mindset. But we have those. We all have those four mindsets. Um, so it's really a question of like, how do we serve those mindsets versus serving before we had like, I think we had like nine consumer segments or something. Right. And, they, and you would have like the extreme skier or the... This is it's, Peggy. She's 34. She lives in the Midwest. It's too she has difficult. Two kids. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So serving right. the mindsets allow us to 
uh, serve more people, um, but also really think through um, our intent. Also, who do like? How do we want people to feel? What it, what state or what behavior are they trying to fulfill? when they're walking into this door or when we, they are buying or browsing this online, then let's make sure that creatively, content-wise, product-wise, we're actually serving that mindset. Of course, we have segmentation as well because we can't do media buys without segmentation, et right. cetera. Um, but it's not the start. It it's doesn't, a probably tactic. Doesn't, it's probably not in the, the creative brief probably starts with the mindset versus 100%. the demo. And 100%. That's, right. Yeah. I mean, it's very hard to inspire a, whether it's a product designer or a brand designer around like Peggy's 34. Yeah, many brands still try to do that. Oh, yeah. the majority. Um, yeah, exactly. But I, I'm not sure. I, I don't see it. And so that's why we moved it we yeah, moved away. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. And yeah. in terms of channels and ways that you're getting these messages out, what do you have your eye on in 2024 with all the changes we've seen in the media landscape? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting. I, I do see, um, I mean, we're in the usual channel like that you know everybody's sure. kind of playing in the same channels of course social and social shopping is still there and it's just getting are you saying tiktok bigger. yeah um emerges a yeah, shopping yeah, yeah. channel tiktok i mean we're still very you know big on instagram or meta we're still there are you selling direct uh yeah you are okay yeah, yeah, yeah. gotcha yeah um so i mean we do have wholesale partnerships yep. of course yeah uh, but we do have a pretty big dtc arm so we in those instances we sell direct which right now i think is it really gives brands a huge distinct advantage because you're yeah. collecting that first party data you're able to model your audience in some way that other companies yeah absolutely don't can't yeah i mean it also does require on the back end that we're able to track everything but yes. yeah exactly <laughs> yes which is a whole other like thing totally right um but no we're also I, I actually think that we're getting back into a more of an analog uh, space right now. I think consumers want to feel things more. Experiential. And not just, yeah, and not just digital. So And that fits very well with your business because you're all about it does. Experiences. Yeah, it yeah. does. It's also retail. Um and we have we have room to get better. And you guys have but you guys have a really good retail we have good experience. Footprint. footprint, yeah. Our experiences are getting better. Uh huh. <laughs> um, well, I guess it's all. It's, I mean, if you're comparing with Apple, it's one thing. But if you're comparing yeah. with the most of the apparel category, yeah, yeah, yeah. putting luxury aside, I think it's yes, it delivers on yes, what the consumer for expects. Sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's like we're we're definitely not on the innovation phase of retail right, right now, which I think is the aspiration that we actually are more innovative yeah. uh, in in stores. Um, it's hard though with the apparel margins. You'd have to. Have you guys ever thought about services or other areas tangential to get oh, to the consumers? It's top of mind, 100%. Right. Um, North Face could be a travel company. It could be, I mean... There's so much we can right, do. Right, right. There's so much program. I mean, right now what we do is um, we have partners. We have great partners that actually offer things like that. And so we actually do give access to our members, but it's not ours. Right. Right. And uh, would it ever make sense for it to... Maybe, maybe not. You know, right. Those are questions that we ask ourselves. But we have fantastic partners um, we also have a very big loyalty base. So we have the Explorer Pass, yeah, um, which is a pretty sizable um, uh, membership. Um, and through that, people do get access. Like we take people on their first experience for their first ski experience or their first trail experience, et cetera. So um, that's definitely something going into 2024 that we want to keep doing. Um, and then, you know, media, it's interesting. I think we're very big on content. We do a lot of long, longer form content, not long form, you know, features, but we do 30, 40 minute films. Really? Um, yeah, a lot. I mean, it's been, it's been a part of our DNA forever and it makes sense. I mean, we have athletes that go places where if you, we don't have a camera there, nobody will know they went. Right. Um, so we make a lot of films. Um, we fund expeditions every year. So uh, we have some really big expeditions actually coming in 2024. Any that you get to go on? No, I mean, actually, there was, I had one opportunity, but it was like literally next week or something. And you know, you're gone for like, it was, and I'd go to base camp of, of Everest. And it's wow. Like, I mean, I, I want to go, I'll do it one day, but you, you know, you're taking a month out of your life to do it, which I can't. Right. <laughs> I'd love to, but I can't. Um, but eventually, eventually uh, I'll do it. Um, it's uh, all that to say, you know, we're, we're, Looking at content and looking at how distribution of content, looking at how we broadcast broadcast content, that's for me a big sh shift I want to make in 2024. Because right now we make a lot of films. They go to film festivals and it's great. They win awards and then they go on YouTube. Right. 
which, you know, they just... So the question is, how's it driving the business? How's it connecting with your consumers? And how do more people get to see it? Right. Um, so we're... That's top of mind also for me in 2024. Well, sure. it's interesting because what I think you're going to see in 24 is that there's going to be a dearth of content because yeah. you had the writer's strike. People are going to find there's less and less on TV. Yeah. And brands can step in and fund it and give consumers stuff to watch and engage. 100%. And also, it doesn't have to be brand content. But right. it can be uh, connected of to the brand, and yeah. that that can. No be one wants to watch a forty-minute commercial. No, right, no. no. But so, also, nobody knows how to make a forty-minute commercial. Right, exactly. <laughs> so I have a question for you. This is sort of um, a little bit of a tangent, but you know, we've seen this year a lot of brands getting behind social issues, mm -hmm. and it really started during the pandemic. And that back then, every brand, you know, had to have some say on what was going on. What do you think, brands? Do you think brands? Have responsibility to take a a really hardcore stance in social issues, or is that something you think they should step out of and just be a business? I think um, so. One, I do think brands need to be a bit more personal, and therefore there are things we need to speak about. Um, but it has to be things you can authentically speak about, right? So just coming out and saying. I stand for this where either internally or like if you've never done anything about it, don't do it. Right. Um, I think there's a fear that brands, brands, and I, I see it. And we all have this fear of like, oh, this is happening in the world. Should I say something? Everybody else is saying something. I should probably say something. Uh, but if I don't say something, people are going to, you have to go back to your, what's true to your brand. Right. And does it Not what sense? might be true to the head of marketing or the CEO, but. Or, or what is right. what is like, oh, everybody else is doing this. I should probably say something. Um, you have to do what's right for your brand. You have to go back to your values. You have to go back to your mission statement. You have to go back to your stance on things. You have to go back to your internal behaviors. Yeah. Um, but it's hard. I mean, it is a fine line. Cancel culture is real. Uh, trolls are real. Um, and we live in a highly polarized society. It's like, I feel... The amount of crises that have emerged, you know, from a brand standpoint. Like, I used to never talk about crisis management. Yeah. It's a big part of my job now. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, because somebody tweets something, somebody says something, there's... There's concerted efforts also. We see a lot of um, movements and groups that just, you know, go out and, and blast things. Target like brands and mm -hmm. go at them for whatever yeah. reason. Yeah. Right. I mean, you know, Pride last year was... a. Uh, you know, it was an intense two or three weeks for us. Um, that's just one of them. I mean, there's, we just had a, you know. An and these decisions that you need to make as CMO, people are looking at you for the answer. Yeah. I mean, the good thing is, you know, yes, it's me, but it's also, you know, of course I work back with, uh, we have a fantastic brand president. I, you know, I work back with, um, you know, the, the, so the president of the North Face, we, the board, depending on how big it gets, the board gets involved. Um, so, it's uh, and the CEO we have a uh, the CEO of EF you know it, it depends on the scale the magnitude, yeah. um, but it, yes very often it starts with like the team looking at it and it's like okay can we handle it or not and then they'll bring it to me and then we'll make the call and then if I need to elevate it I will. That's depending. something they don't teach you in CMO school. Not no, like there is CMO school. No, but it's no, something you kind of learn on yeah. the spot and every I mean you know we've there's crisis and crisis. I mean we've had athletes who have accidents. That's like. Very big crisis yeah. for us. Um, and then there's, you know, I mentioned pride or somebody said something. Yeah. You know, you 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 handle every single case is different. There's almost no single blueprint that you can really apply. No, I get you that. Always have a different situation. Yeah. yeah. So uh, wrapping up here, Sophie. I mean, you've had a really fun career being at Nike and now um, this new role at North Face. When you look back at your career, what are some of the things that you think you did right to set you up for being in a position where you can actually choose and do mm. the things that you want to do? I mean, you said you didn't, you know, Nike was great, but you wanted to try digital. And then, you know, there were things that you loved about North Face. And it's a luxury to be able to choose where you want to go sure. at such a high level, um, you know, in the corporate world. What do you think that you did right that enabled you to have that type of freedom and flexibility and choice? Um. I don't know if it's because I did it right, but I do think I was lucky enough to have great mentors. Okay. First of all, I do think mentors are very important and you should seek them out. Um, too many people, I think, think that they can do it on their own. Or yeah. I see this 
I'm going to sound old, but I see this generation now who just like, they don't want to hear. They don't want to listen. They don't want to learn from anyone. Yep. It's just, you can't they do They want to watch that. a YouTube video and yeah. figure it out on their own. Right. Like, there <laughs> are people who actually have fantastic experience and you should probably listen to them, even if you don't like what they have to say. I The mentors I've had- or Even I've if had, you don't like, accept their advice, at least hear it. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Um, so ment mentorship, um, I think, has been huge for me. Um, and then I think like I- put a lot of value, like I have a lot of ego. <laughs> so there's, I put a lot of value in who I am and what I, how I feel. And so sometimes if it doesn't feel right, I definitely follow my guts. And so. It takes confidence to do that though. Yeah. Um, I, it's a little bit of my personality as well, but it's, um, I just, I mean, you know, leaving Nike was a big deal. Financially it's a big deal. Of course. <laughs> leaving a place like Nike. Um, but that's how I felt. And so sometimes you just go with your guts. And, you know, when I left Everlane, I didn't have a job. I didn't have the North Face lined up. I, I left and I kind of took a, I was like, all right, I need, I'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, easier to do at this stage in my career, obviously. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, a little bit of, yeah, I'm, I'm confident. I'm definitely, I, I mean, I have imposter syndrome at times for sure i don't understand why people want to hear me necessarily but it's uh but in terms of my career and the things i can control um i'm much more attuned to what i think i need uh in order to be happy or in order to just keep on growing yeah um, but growth ultimately growth is very important like i the idea of being content and just stagnate it's like that scares me right um got to keep on moving yep and that's yeah. what drives you yeah and is it is there a mantra that you like to live by or something oh, that comes to mind i mean i i have one but it's more to help me mentally what is that <laughs> it's like every day it's um because i have a hard time getting up and so me too uh, my my dad <laughs> growing up would always say the day belongs to those who wake up early which is true i mean figure that's how you define early right Exactly, <laughs> but figuratively and exactly that, in, and and literally. Um, so I think about that a lot because early adoption is being early, right? Like I, I think about that a lot, mostly now with the metaverse and all that. I'm like, oh, I see those opportunity, and we're not going after it. But that's early. Like the day belongs. I think about that all the time. Yeah, AI, everything is happening right now. Yeah. So it's uh, he used to say that be to wake me up. Uh, that's kind of like what's the start, but I've kind of taken in to actually mean many other things. Very cool. You, know, you want to be first to the warm, right? Well, thanks for sharing that. And thanks yeah. for joining today. It was a of great course. conversation. Yeah. I didn't really appreciate it. I can't wait for our audience to hear it. So Thank on behalf you. of Susie and Ivy team, thanks again to Sophie Bambuk, Chief Marketing Officer at the North Face for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. So next time, see you soon, everyone. Take care. Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and Guest Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcasts. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for the Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.